Hi folks, this is a, a lecture on William Wilberforce and uh, I hope you enjoy this lecture. Uh, the bibliography is Traveling G M Traveling History of England, page 599, Life of Wilberforce, volume 1, Thomas Chalmers, Miss Oliphant, page 43, and DC Somerville, Short History of Our Religion. That's just some of the references in this lecture. Boswell, the famous biographer of Johnson, attended that unforgettable meeting. He wrote, I, I, said, I saw, he said, what seemed to me a mere shrimp mount on the table. But as I listened, he grew and grew until the shrimp became a whale. Impressed with the speech and liking the man, the Yorkshire elite decided they wanted Wilberforce to represent them this Yorkshire seat had political clout, so when in 1784 he was elected he held some power, also having a large fortune and being a close friend of Pitt, a whole new world opened up to him. Investi invitations to balls ensued and clubs coveted his membership, famous hostess hostesses adored him, even the Prince of Wales gave him public compliments. Indeed everyone loved his wit and charm, his looks did not go amiss either what days they were in the 1780s. Things were to change drastically. At 26 he went on a trip to the continent with members of his family and a close friend, Isaac Milner. The party settled down in, nice, in a nice at picturesque villa. Soon the two young men made their way back home, leaving the rest behind. To pass the time away while travelling, they read Doddridge's Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul by a nonconformist divine was written to be an eloquent plea for sinners to come to Christ. Wilberforce became absorbed in what the writer had to say. After the parliamentary session, the friends went on their travels again, meeting the original party in Genoa and going on later to the Barnese Alps. Once again on the way home, the young men began to read, this time the New Testament in Greek. Before arriving back home, Wilberforce had become a Christian. It marked a revolutionary change in the man, both in his lifestyle and attitude to his fellow man. His conversion, in a sense, not only changed him, but history also. He writes about what made him become a Christian. Quote, the deep guilt and black ingratitude of my past life forced itself upon me in the strongest closure, and I condemn myself for having wasted my precious time and talents. It was not so much the fear of punishment, uh, as such was the effect which this thought produced, that for months I was in a state of the deepest depression from strong conviction of my guilt. He continues, what infinite love that Christ should die for me. For a short while he retired from public life to think through his faith. John Newton became his close friend. He often consulted the famous revivalist pastor, one question which Wilberforce put to his confidant was, should I stay in politics? Newton nodded affirmation. Wilberforce accepted his advice. On his return to Parliament, he related his conversation to Pitt. The young Prime Minister could not understand his friend, but they remained close. Pitt noticed that Wilberforce needed something which would give... Um, which would give after the parliamentary session, the friends went on the party and go into later to the Barney's Alps. Sorry. Sorry, that's, uh, uh, Pitt noticed that Wilberforce needed something which would give him a purpose, an overall goal where his whole skills would be awakened. He suggested the slave trade question. Wilberforce consented but told Pitt he would not be a party man. Also he needed a policy which would not impede his constituency work. The slave trade and the horror of its evil had been brought into the public eye and had a long history. The Quakers had raised their voice in the 16th century and continued to do so. Richard Baxter condemned the practice and John Wesley issued his famous sermon, Thoughts on Slavery. Last in the line who really caused a storm was Grenville Sharp when he defended the black man's right to freedom in the courts. Thomas Clarkson began the subject. 
it was obvious that what was needed was someone to champion the cause in Parliament, and after much prayer and thought, Wilberforce commenced his task. There was no political opportunism in his decision, only a desire to do his duty and show practical love to his fellow men. In the spring of 1787, he brought the matter to the House and he made his first speech on the subject on May 12, 1789. It was on these lines, now undoubtedly it is our great duty as Christians to love each other and as brethren, and to endeavour whenever we can to try and dry the tear and see, ease the pangs of our common nature. But I do protest to you that my grand arrangement of this most detestable and guilty practice, the slave trade, is because it is char chargeable with holding in bondage in darkness. and blood one third of our hip because it erects barriers along more than 3,000 miles of the shores of that vast continent which shuts out light and truth and humanity and kindness. The more Wilberforce petitioned in his epic quest for abolition, the more he had enemies. Commerce was not happy as they would lose vast revenues and politicians were full of prejudice. One even stated the slaves like travelling so why stop their enjoyment? Others thought it sheer foolishness, maintaining that the Negroes were happy as they were. He seemed to get no further, and his voice became drowned by a waterfall of more important issues. The French Revolution to, came to the fore, and public opinion reasoned that if slaves were let loose in the colonies and at home, absolute chaos would ensue. The slaves would resolve, revolt, and the opposition brought in delaying tactics. Reports were commissioned, and more debates and resolutions, but no concrete action. Then at last, when victory appeared, his supporters, supporters lost the vote because some of them missed the ballot while attending the theatre. To top it all, his friend Pitt began to lose interest in the whole affair. For 17 long years, he campaigned in Parliament and his labours bore no fruit. Over these years, the nation grew to admire his integrity. He never became bitter against his enemies, but kept his sweet character Throughout all these years in the political wilderness, Wilberforce had a dual career, his Christian work. In 1797, he wrote a book called Real Christianity. His message was that only individuals being converted to Christ would bring hope to society. This brought to the hearts of many, and even Chalmers, a great intellectual of the day, became a Christian throughout reading it. In 1804, Wilberforce became involved with the British and Foreign Bible Society and was to remain a guide and help to them through the rest of his life. A friend to help and Bibles were distributed at home and abroad. He gathered many influential friends around him at Clapham, among them Lord Taymouth, uh, Grenville Sharp, Henry Thornton, Sir Thomas Fowlell, Buxton and the famous historian Macaulay. These men gave them their support and advising him behind the scene in Parliament and encourage him to take a wider leadership role among evangelicals in England. Apart from being a popular speaker at Bible conferences, he did much for philanthropic, philanthropic, or philanthropic work. Regular contributions to Wesley's widow and Hannah More's schools were made in abundance. His fame as a generous giver spread to the streets, hence countless hard cases knocked upon his door or received help. When national crises came, he gave liberally. Public opinion perceived that he was not a self-seeker, had political further and independence of will went far in giving the public assurance of his sincerity, especially when at times he opposed his friend Pitt. So it was with the public opinion in his favour and his colleagues won over that in 1807, on the 23rd of February, late at night, the House voted 283 to 16 in favour of abolishing the slave trade in the British Empire. Victory at last, after 17 years of pounding against the iron, prejudice skull of Parliament, hope for the black people. History had be been made, and from throughout the world, tributes came flooding in, offering congratulations at the momentous achievement. Soon after, he began to lobby for the emancipation of slaves, but retired, leaving the job to Buxton, his trusted friend. Before Wilberforce died, he heard the good news that Buxton had brought Parliament to vote for the emancipation of slaves. He died a happy man in eight. The achievement was great, 
although he was criticized by contemporaries and some modern historians, Hazlitt said Wilberforce was more a man of money who wanted the glory but never really risked much in his life for the slaves, end of quote. D.C. Somerville wrote, a stupid man with a very defective religion, end of quote. Perhaps G.M. Trevelyan put a more objective view than when he, when he wrote, it was a turning point in the history of the world when Wilberforce and his friends succeeded in arousing the conscience of the British people to stop the slave traffic in 1807 and to abolish slavery in 1833, just before the development of the interior of Africa by the European races. If slavery and the slave trade had continued through the 19th century, armed with the new weapons of the Industrial Revolution and modern science, the tropics would have, would have become a vast slave farm for white exploitation, and the European would degraded by the disease of slave civilization of which the Roman Empire had died. A Christian in politics can achieve much. A man such as Wilberforce, eloquent, gentle, intelligent, kind, sincere, equipped with a burning faith to help him to go on against all odds. He set a standard for future generations of politicians, and above all he acted not in his own strength, but in the strength of, of his God. Let us remember uh, Wilberforce and the great achievements that he did for, for all humanity. This was a, an article that I, I wrote for um, a magazine, uh, but I've put it in lecture form, and uh, I hope that you will find it a blessing, and may God bless you. Thank you for listening.